your Bibles tonight to uh, Acts chapter uh, Acts chapter 14, and we will be in Acts, uh, but we will not be only in chapter 14, we'll be in chapter 19 as well. If you don't have a Bible, there are some available. If you can help find a Bible uh, for anyone around you that needs one, help them turn there. Acts chapter 14, and I just want to read uh, a couple of verses in chapter 14, and then we will just uh, pray and ask the Lord's help. And I want to teach a message that's really part two of the message that we preached last night, not last night, last Wednesday night, from 1 Thessalonians. Okay, so we're in Acts chapter 14. And if you will look down with me, down to uh, verse 21, and uh, it, we'll just kind of pick up our context from there, and we'll read down a couple of verses. So do you see verse 21 of Acts 14? The Bible says... And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And we will stop and ask the Lord's help there this evening. I want to just, uh, this evening, I hope the message isn't boring to you. I hope it's informational. I hope it's something that maybe where light bulbs go on, you say, ah, okay, that makes sense. And maybe it'll help you to know God's plan, what Christ is doing in the church, maybe a little bit better than you do before. So let's pray and ask the Lord to help us understand tonight. God, we do need your help tonight. We, we re understand that this book, the Bible, is your word and that it is written without error. We understand this evening that this book is able to make the simple wise. It's able to bring understanding. And I just pray that you would help us to understand a little bit more about leadership in the church. And we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to uh, just bring up a couple of things that perhaps you have or perhaps you haven't thought about. A lot of people don't because of the status quo. Uh, most Christians never think about where the church got started, the concept of church as we know it in all the different variations that we even know it in. Most people don't know uh, or they don't think about when did the church start because the church the, as a body, as a concept, predated all of us, right? No one was around when Jesus told Peter on this rock, and they used the word that refers to the rock of me, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But Jesus Christ instituted the church, and it was a foreign concept to the disciples. If you were to read the first chapter of Acts, by the way, the word Acts, don't let it confuse you, the word Acts simply means acts or actions of the apostles in establishing the church. So where did the church come from? Well, the apostles were the twelve, that Jesus used to establish a new organization which had never before existed, Christ Church. The church is referred to or called a lot of things in the Bible. It's called the body of Christ, Christ's body. Now, how could the church be Christ's body? Well, because it isn't a building. It is believers who have Jesus in them, Christ in us. And we are the body or the building of Jesus Christ. The Bible refers to the build, the, the church two ways. It refers to it as a body, refers to it as a building. So it's called sometimes a temple, which is simply a word that means building, and it's sometimes called a body. The body, the Bible says, is made up with members, and we are the members. So if you'll think of your body, and you'll go all the way back to anatomy class, or uh, I remember, uh, what was it, uh, uh, Physical Lee, what was the class we had that Mrs. Fink taught in high school? You, you have to don't let me down on this one. It was like a, a physical education or was it anatomy? Mrs. Fink? Yes, Donna Fink, and you were in it. She taught a class. Yes, she did. <laughs> and anyway, we had to learn all the body parts in it. It wasn't biology. We learned the body parts there too. We had to learn all the muscles. Anatomy? anatomy? No, that wasn't the class though. It was No, it was kind of like a PE class. We always call the health class growing up. Well, we're going to debate this one forever. <laughs> we better just forget about it. All right. Anyway, all right, so when we learned all the different parts of the body, I mean, you know what the parts of the hand are, right? 
the tarsals and the metatarsals and the carpals and the metacarpals and tarsals and metatarsals on the feet, okay. carpals and metacarpals are in the hands, Lost right? Hand. Did I got that right? Uh, and uh, you know, you learn, you, you know, you have the radius and the ulna and uh, your different bones and then the, all the names different of the different bones. muscles. I don't remember them all. I could probably get a 50% on an anatomy test right now. I don't know. Anyway, my point is this. The Bible calls us, each part of the body is a member. So a bone is a member of the body. A finger, you could say, is a member of the body. And each part of the body is a member. And you, the Bible says, who have the Holy Spirit living in you because you've received Jesus as your Savior, you're part of the body. So sometimes we say things that aren't quite accurate, and we mean well, and I understand what someone means, but sometimes we'll say things like, I'm going to go to the church, right? You ever said that? I'm going to go to the church. And what we're actually talking about is actually like this place. Now this doesn't look much like a church, it's more like a storefront, but it's the, it's the church building where we, the body, the church, where we meet at, but this building is not the church, we're the church. So we could meet in a park or a parking lot or any place in a home, and we, as the parts of the body, are the church. Okay, does that make, everybody's on the same page, right? Okay. So the word church uh, is from two Greek words, ek kaleo. Ek means out of, kaleo means I call or the ones who are called. So the church is the ones who are called out of what? Out of everybody else. In other words, unless you receive Jesus as your Savior, you're not part of the church. Being part of this body is something that is a choice that's determined by receiving what Jesus did when He died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again. By you saying, I want Jesus to be my Savior. I want God to be my Father. I want the gift of eternal life. What Jesus did when He died on the cross for me. When that happens, the Bible says God's Spirit comes in you and you're part of the body, part of the church. Okay, now that is what we're talking about when we define church. Hope that makes sense to you. So now the Acts is the actions recorded in the Scripture of how the church got started. Now I want to point something out to you because I started with a concept and I want us to uh, stay uh, with that concept. I said most of us... The church existed before we did, so it predated us. So the notion of a church is not something that's new necessarily to anybody here, right? Uh, most of you live down the street from a church building. Most of you went to church growing up. But in Christ's day, in the Apostles' day, there had never been a church before. It didn't exist. And so it was a brand new concept. It's a little comical to me when a church is named their a church named something temple. Because the temple is a place where God dwelt among the Jews, and uh, the church isn't a temple. Now the body is a temple because God lives in us now, instead of in a building. Okay, I don't want to get confusing, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but we've been talking about the, the construction or the makeup of a local church, and I want to go uh, to what we saw in Acts, and I want us to notice something. The apostles had gone from city to city preaching the gospel that Jesus was the Son of God, that Jesus died on the cross for the sins of, of the world, and that anyone who received Jesus as their Savior uh, would be saved, would be born again, would be part of this church. Now, here we are in uh, chapter 23, and we see something that is new. In verse 23, the Bible says, When they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they command, commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So the apostles at this time have turned over authority or leadership or they have put in authority in every church elders who are ordained. Now the word ordained is uh, another word that kind of means like laying on of hands. In other words, you, you put your hand on sort of like passing the mantle uh, on or authority or leadership on. I was ordained before I began to be a pastor. We had... Uh, we had a service. I actually had a time when I was examined. And a bunch of like, uh, I don't remember if it was like nine men, nine preachers got together and interrogated me, asked me doctrinal questions for a couple of hours. I was, was I 21, Melissa? I was 22 when I got ordained. 22, maybe 23. I don't know. I was, I was young. And uh, it was pretty intimidating having guys with the word doctor in front of their names <laughs> who had been to multiple schools and, 
and uh, universities and all this thing interrogating me and, and glaring at me while they did. I don't know why they can't smile when they ask you questions. <laughs> but they'd ask me questions and, you know, kind of like, you know, give me that, that you frown, you know. And so then after that, uh, they made the decision that they believed that God's hand was on my life, that I was called to the gospel ministry. They laid hands on me, prayed over me, and ordained me into the gospel ministry. And that's what Paul is precisely talking about here, but that would have been something new in the church. In other words, this would be something that there there'd never been pastors before. Now think of this. Most of the churches were comprised with what ethnicity of people? Jews, Jews right? The first church was at Jerusalem. They were Jews. The church began at Jerusalem. So Jews were the first believers. They would have been accustomed, of course, to a priest in a temple, not a pastor or an elder. Now you could study in the Scripture and you'd see, for instance, in Titus that the word elder and bishop and pastor, they're used interchangeably. Those words mean the same thing. And they'll use one word in one Scripture talking about this and then the very next verse use a, a different word to mean the same thing. Okay, so the Jewish believers who are ordaining elders or bishops or pastors, the, the words mean the same thing. They have the same application. They would have been accustomed to a priest, wouldn't they? Now let me ask you a question. What are the qualifications for a priest? You have to be, from Levi. Levi. You have to be a Levite, right? To be a priest, you have to be from the tribe of Levi. Let me, I, just, I don't want to be silly, I don't want to be mean, but let me just ask you a practical question. How many Levites are there today? Who knows? Who knows how many? Just, what, what person on earth knows how many Levites there are today? The Lord. Only God knows. That's the answer I was looking for. Okay, I think that's on purpose, don't you? Because God isn't using the priesthood anymore. God is using the church. And so we live in the church age. All right, now I, I want to be practical, but I think that's a help, isn't it? Because a lot of people are confused about terms. There aren't priests today. There aren't Levites today. We don't know who is a Levite. Who were the people that were ordained elders? Well, they were people that the apostles believed evidenced God's call in their life, and they were made to be pastors in the church. Okay, last week, now you say, Pastor, you spent, I don't know what this is going. Well, first of all, it's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting just to think about some things. See, you've grown up where there's always been a church, but you never watched a church develop. In Acts, we see the church actually develop. It never existed before. And so one of the advantages they had was they thought all the way through it. A lot of times we just, it's just the way it's always been, isn't it? Well, I don't know, it's, you know, hey, why do they do that in a church? I don't know, that's just what they've always done. It's a tradition or whatever. Well, we need to be thinking people because sometimes what's always done isn't what was established by Christ and His apostles in the church. Last week, we were in 1 Thessalonians and we looked at a church that was established after the apostles had been there for only three weeks. Literally, the apostles came to town, they preached in the synagogues, a lot of people were born again. After three weeks' time, if you read in Acts, after three weeks' time, the apostles were literally driven out of the city. And they tried to kill them, they arrested them, and then they, uh, a man by the name of Jason, you just read in Acts, basically posted their bond, and they were driven out of the city after three weeks' time. And literally, years later, Paul is in prison, writing a letter to the church at Thessalonica, and he'd sent Timothy to find out how they're doing, and a church that had been established in three weeks was thriving. Literally, people who had only heard three weeks worth of truth were standing by the truth they'd learned, were preaching it to others, and their testimony, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, was known everywhere. In other words, the way that they were living for Jesus and their faith and their example in Christ was known everywhere. And we saw that we answered the question, what happens when there's a leadership vacuum in the church? In other words, don't you think a church, a brand new church that's never existed before needs the apostles who are the foundational gift? They are the persons who are the authority in the church and tells the church how it functions. Don't you think a church needs the apostles for more than three weeks when it's never existed before? I would surely think so. Can you imagine three weeks and you get a course on all you need to know about being faithful to God and serving in a church. And yet the church at Thessalonica did that. And we asked the question, for instance, what will be the difference between the church at Corinth, which had all kinds of problems? 
And yet they'd had the Apostle Paul and the team that traveled with the Apostle Paul there for more than a year establishing that church. And they had all kinds of problems. And the church at Thessalonica had no problems. And yet they'd only had apostles for three weeks. What made the difference? We read, if you read, and again, we're not going to read it now, but if you read in 1 Thessalonians, you'll see that the people in Thessalonica were the same kind of people that were in Corinth. They were pagans, idol worshipers. And yet those pagan idol worshipers were faithful Christians after only hearing the gospel preached for a matter of three weeks. What made the difference? Well, what made the difference was just the people. It was the, the mindset of the people to say, you know something, I wish we had the apostles here to teach us, but that's no excuse. We know enough truth that we're going to live it and we're going to stand by it. And God give us Christians that don't need leadership to live for Jesus. God give us Christians that say, I'm going to do right whether I have help or not. Well, isn't it amazing when somebody messes up their lives, they literally are living the absolute opposite of what the Scripture says they ought to live in. Isn't it amazing how oftentimes they say, well, you know what, the reason I've gone this direction, the reason I made this mistake is because, and they'll point out the absence or the lack of something in someone else's life for a reason why they're not everything they should be. God give us Christians that say, you know what, I'm going to answer to God. And I'm not going to be able to say, God, the apostles left after three weeks. And so the church of Thessalonica was a great example. And we practically speaking, said, okay, so what does that mean for us here at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church? Well, practically speaking, what it means is that if there's ever a leadership vacuum in this church, if God takes your pastor, what are you going to do? You know, it's something churches, it's like we don't want to think about it, we don't want to talk about it, and we don't want to plan it. But what happens if God takes your pastor to this church? Well, certainly some things will change, won't they? Things always change when leadership changes. But last week we talked about good things that could change, things that could change for the better, or things that could change for the worse. And if this church becomes any kind of a different church than when it was established for the purpose of, that would be a bad change. And we as believers need to have our minds wrapped around that. The second thing is that we need to understand the importance of a pastor and how to, how to appoint a pastor. And so I want to kind of just, just kind of touch on it a little bit this evening. Uh, I do want to, before we go to, uh, if you'll turn to Acts chapter 19, our next passage of Scripture, and we look at the, the duty of a pastor in a church. We looked at the appointment of pastors. I want to look at the duty of a pastor. Before we do that, uh, while you turn to Acts chapter 19, or uh, I should have said Acts chapter 20, not Acts chapter 19. My mistake there. Turn to Acts chapter 20. While you do that, I want to read a verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he's writing about this matter of the, how crazy they've gotten with speaking in tongues and, uh, um, and, uh, in, in, and relying on prophecy more than the authority of the Scripture. And the Apostle Paul uh, said in, in verse 8, he said, Charity, he's talking about love, he said the importance of charity, uh, the love that gives to the, to, to the brethren essentially is what charity means. He said, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. He's talking about you know, special knowledge. And he said, For we know in part, we prophesy in part. Verse 10, But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now what is Paul referencing when he talks about that which is perfect? I, I, believe, yeah, I just believe it's clear from the, from the context that he's talking about the completed Word of God. See, the early church couldn't open up to the book of Acts. Acts was being done. It wasn't written. And the things that the apostles did in Acts were being done, but no one had written about it until Luke wrote about Acts. So there, the, the perfect Word of God didn't exist. So if you want to know, hey, wh what does a pastor do? You had to ask an apostle. You didn't have a Bible. But we have a Bible. That which is perfect has come. You see that? And so we have the perfect Word of God. The Word of God claims to be perfect. Matter of fact, the last couple of verses in Revelation in your Bible say that the, if any man adds to the words of the book of this prophecy, then God's going to add to him the curses in the book. It's a perfect book. You don't add to it. If any man takes away from the words of the prophecy of the book, the Bible says God will take away his part out of the book of life. You don't take away anything from the Word of God. It's a perfect book. And I'm glad for that, aren't you? Because we live in a lot of doubt. We would just debate on the basis of we really would just come down to deciding what we like instead of knowing what's true about how the church is supposed to be in form and function. 
Now you're in Acts chapter 20, aren't you? Let's go down to uh, verse 17. This is when Paul is sailing to go back to Jerusalem. Excuse me. In verse 17, he says, And from Miletus, speaking of Paul, he sent to Ephesus, and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you in all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, verse 19, and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. And then he goes on to say in verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. There is the gospel in, the, in that verse. Now, here he is, Paul is having, we could call this sort of Paul's swan song. The Apostle Paul realizes that he's about to go to the end of his life. He's about to be put to death for, be, for serving Jesus. And he knows that the Holy Spirit's told him, when you go back to Jerusalem, things, events are going to befall you there where they're going to try to kill you. Ultimately, he ends up in prison in Rome, and he ends up, we believe, being beheaded in Rome for his faith in Jesus Christ. Paul knows that he's approaching the end of his life. And he recognizes that without his leadership, the church could possibly flounder, couldn't they? I mean, he's established all of these churches all around the world, and if he dies, what happens to the churches? Isn't it comforting to know what happens? Look what's happening here today. We're meeting tonight because of the way God used the apostles to establish the church. Isn't that neat? God's still working in the churches. That's what happened. So we know the rest of the story if you ever listen to Paul Harvey uh, we know what the ending of it is. God's still at work. The church is still functioning just like the way it was established by the apostles. But Paul is having a swan song. In other words, he's having a last meeting with these pastors and charging them, giving them some words of encouragement. And he's going to tell them, if you look down to verse, I believe it's verse 28, he's going to tell them what the duties of a pastor are. And here this evening, folks, I want us to listen. I want us to know, you know, if God were to take your pastor... We don't have any guarantee of the, of the days that we have to live, do we? We don't know how long we're going to live. You know what we have a guarantee of? Eternal life. You know Jesus as your Savior, the Bible says you'll never perish. No man's able to pluck you out of the Father's hand. So I know this, I'm never going to die as far as my soul goes, but any day now this body, something could happen. Something could fall on me. Something could break inside of me. God could take my breath. I don't know, but something could happen to Pastor, or I could live way longer than I wish to. Uh, I know this, I've outlived my sister by a year and a half. The Lord took her, you know, so in our family, could happen sooner than later, couldn't it? We don't know. I don't know how many days we have. But the reality of it is, is that one of the things that I think we as a church ought to know is what to look for if we ever had to find a pastor. We need to be wise about that, don't we? How do we know what to look for if we ever find a pastor? Well, Paul describes to the pastors at Ephesus what to do when he's not around, and he begins in verse 28 by saying, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Wow, what a statement of responsibility to these elders. Take heed. That's a warning. Matter of fact, it's a stern warning. If you're a pastor and Paul says a sentence to you like this, guess what? You're not snickering. You're not cracking jokes. He says, you take heed. Take heed. Watch out, he says, therefore, unto yourselves. You watch out for yourself and unto all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Now notice who called these men to be elders. See, we know that the apostles appointed these men, but who really called these men? The Holy Ghost. My friend, if anything needs to be uh, so clear that there's no question or no doubt about, it's that the pastor of a church is called by the Holy Spirit to be a pastor. We've got a lot of people that are looking for a position. I just want to tell you something. Uh, I love being pastor. I love being pastor of this church. Wouldn't do anything else. Wouldn't be anything else for the world, but only because God called me to do it. There's no glamour in being a pastor. You think there's glamour in being pastor. I'm glad you think so. I'm glad that's, that's a thought. But it, it's not a glamorous position, my friend. It's a servant job. 
It means that you serve people. That's what it means to be pastor. But not only that, but there's a great responsibility because the Bible then says, feed the flock of God which is among you. You know, it is not the pastor's job to entertain. It is the pastor's job to make sure that there is nourishment given to God's people. Man, I pray to God before you leave here this evening that God has used me to feed you to literally help you to know Him better, to understand His plan, His purpose in your life better, and to be encouraged to live for Jesus. But more than that, to actually know something. You know, it's a tragedy, isn't it? it it's a tragedy. This is funny. You ever ask a Sunday school kid what they learned in Sunday school? Even a good Sunday school teacher holds their breath when you ask a kid, what did you learn in Sunday school today? And you know, it's just, just as bad for a pastor. I'm amazed. Sometimes I preach a message and I know exactly what I preached. And I hope everybody does. Then somebody will say, yeah, it was great how you preached about it. And I'm thinking, I didn't mention that. It's not what I preached about today. And I just think, either I'm a terrible communicator. I did not communicate uh, what the Word of God said. Or this person didn't listen. You ever ask the question, what did you learn in Sunday school today? And the kids go, uh, God. What did you learn in Sunday school today? Uh, Jesus. Those are like the two popular answers. You know, what, what they teach in Sunday school today? The Bible. You know, but adults are actually the same. Now listen to me for just a second, will you please? My friend, actually the reality of it is, is that if you've got a good pastor, you'll learn something in church. You'll actually be fed. You'll actually be encouraged. You'll actually, sometimes you'll be challenged. Sometimes you'll say, you know what, I've always thought that, but the Word of God says differently. I don't like it, but I'm wrong. And I've been challenged to change my thinking because of it. You ought to be, if you're being fed, you ought to be challenged, oughtn't you? And so feed the flock of God which is among you. It's a grand responsibility. Then the Bible says, uh, taking the oversight, uh, or, or I'm sorry, this, I, I said this wrong, I mixed it with another passage, over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. You know, some pastors are, are pretty good at feeding the flock, but they're not very good at managing things. They can't handle the finances, or they can't handle the organization, or whatever. You know, uh, my friend, that's one of the qualifications for a pastor. To feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. And then we see a statement of value. Listen, if you think it is no small matter to covet to be the pastor of a church, just remember what the church cost Jesus. His life. In other words, so that we could be born again, Jesus Christ died on the cross so that we could have forgiveness for sin. Listen, you can't work for forgiveness of your sin. All works are is works. Sin is what God judges you for. But Jesus died on the cross for your sin. He shed His blood. If Jesus' death was not necessary for forgiveness of sin, my friend, the, the cross of Jesus is the greatest mockery that's ever occurred in life. You know that? But Jesus gave His blood. Now let me ask you a question. How much does God value the people in the church. What's the value of an individual soul in the church? Well, the value of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I get a little, you know, that little, you ever get scared enough to shake a little bit? You know, like, ooh, I get a little bit of, you know, a little bit scared of that. Jesus Christ, God, the Holy Ghost has made you an overseer, but Jesus Christ has given His blood for the flock. It's a grand responsibility. Let me ask you a question. How important is it that you have a pastor who understands the value of the flock? <coughs> How valuable are the people in the church? You know, it's so grievous, isn't it? When you see new leadership come in and act as though the people that are there, oh, we're going to change things, or we're going to, you know, we don't care what these people, a lot of times they try to drive people out of the church, try to get rid of people. I, you know, if you don't want to get on board, you just need to get out. And they act as though there's no value in the people that Jesus gave His blood for. He shed His life's blood for. Oh, if you ever get a pastor, you ever have to place this pastor, find somebody that values the flock. Find somebody that realizes what Jesus has invested and understands the responsibility toward that investment. People mean everything to God, don't they? It's hard to understand, but God loves you so much, Jesus died on the cross for you. You mean everything to Him. Okay, and then I want to look at one last thing, and unfortunately I won't get enough time uh, to look at everything I'd like to, but verse um, 29, Paul said this, he said, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. 
So it's the difference between a person who sacrifices himself for the flock and there's a person who comes in and kills the flock and sacrifices them for himself, isn't there? And there are people that literally look at the church as something to plunder. You know, to some degree, and I don't mean this in the wrong way, but to some degree the world looks at the church that way. Uh, this time of the year, tragically, I am contacted by different means, probably ten times a day, sometimes more, sometimes less, by people who want something from the church. And now some of them are just needy. I mean, they just have needs and they think, well, where should we go? Well, my friend, if you can't go to the church, where should you go? If people in the church don't care, but some people just look at it like, I'm going to get something from there. I hate to say it, but there are people that call themselves ministers that see the church as a means of support. They literally see the church as means of... I don't want to be silly about this, but um, I probably get a hundred people from India every week that call themselves, quote, ministers that are trying to get me to send them money from our church. I probably get a hundred people from... Uh, from Africa a week that call themselves ministers. And if you speak to the people that know them there, what they want really is me to send them money, not to feed the poor, but so they can buy BMWs and uh, nice cars. And, you know, I'm serious about this. This is tragic. But in other words, what do they see the flock as? They see the flock as an asset, something to plunder. And that's a grievous wolf. That's a grievous wolf. That's somebody that's, that wants to sacrifice the flock instead of sacrificing for the flock. You know, if, you, if God ever has you call a pastor, call somebody that wants to give himself, not somebody that wants to get from you. There's a big difference. There's a big difference. Uh, another qualification for a pastor. Uh, look at this. Paul said in verse 30, he said, Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. This is the last thing we're going to look at, but we're going to see that Paul warns this group of pastors from Ephesus. He said, look out for you guys. You know, it's interesting, isn't it, how power can go to the head of somebody? You ever watch somebody start in politics? This is so hard to watch for me. I don't want to be controversial this evening. No, I won't be controversial this evening. I won't use anybody in particular. But you watch a person who's a local homegrown boy, you know, and he maybe runs for county commissioner or something locally. And, I mean, he runs on some causes. He really resonates and represents the people. Like the things that he says he's interested in fixing or doing something about, it's what people want to do something about, and he usually does a pretty good job. And then sometimes he's really well liked because he does a good job, maybe rises from a local level to a state level, maybe runs for state legislature or something like that. And you see him kind of get a little uh, less connected to the people. We have a, a great example of this actually in my home state. I'm from Kansas. Bob Dole's from Kansas. Uh, how many of y'all know who Bob Dole is? Uh, Bob Dole's from Russell, Kansas, about 60 miles uh, from my house or from, from where I grew up. And uh, he actually doesn't live in Russell, Kansas and actually hasn't been there in years. He has a room and a home in Russell, Kansas. You drive into Russell, it says home of Bob Dole. And he was a war hero and some other things. But uh, Bob, Bob Dole was a guy, he was, he was a pretty solid guy in Kansas. But you know, he went away to Washington and he's never come home. And, uh, you know, when it comes to doing things for the people in the state of Kansas, <laughs> he doesn't care about the people in Kansas. I hate to say it, he doesn't care about the people in Kansas anymore. He, he got to Washington. You know what happens to most people when they get to Washington? They get to be part of the in crowd. Part of the frat, the fraternity. The swamp. Yeah, the swamp. <laughs> I don't want to get political this evening, folks. But, you know, you could have a guy that started out pretty solid, and all of a sudden he gets up here and he doesn't see himself as the same as everybody down here. And he changes. And Paul actually looked at these pastors who he's called to meet with him as he's on his way, he passed by Ephesus, and he's back at Miletus, and he said, come meet with me. And he looks at these pastors and he said, some of you guys, some of you guys are going to get people to follow you instead of Jesus. And I can imagine him making eye contact with individuals there, and I can think them going like, oh, not me! <laughs> it's a pretty important warning, isn't it? It's a pretty important warning. You know, somebody could be something when they start, and they could be something different later on. They can change.
know, that's one of the worst things you can do when it comes to truth. If truth is truth, it never changes. And if you hold to the truth, you'll never change. You know why we have denominations of the church? You know why there are denominations? You say, Pastor, you're Baptist. I know, Baptist is doctrine. It's not denominational. There's no, there's no denomination that this church is part of. We're independent. We're, we're non-denominational. You know why there are denominations? Because people unite over false doctrine. Whatever thing they teach that's different than the Bible teaches, people get together to defend it. And then they write a creed or a confession or a different document other than the Bible to defend what they believe. Why? Well, because they want people to follow them. You don't want to follow a man. You want to follow Jesus. Always. And so, church, if we ever have to find a pastor... By the way, we don't even have to get rid of this one to find one, do we? Maybe we'll have to call an assistant pastor someday if we grow. If we ever have to do it, we need to look for these things as a qualification for a pastor. I know it's not an exciting message this evening, but I think that it ought to be insightful for us. It ought to help us to think and know what to look for. Incidentally, if you're looking for a church, these are things you ought to look for. Because if they're not there, it's not a good church. Or doesn't have good leadership, doesn't have a good pastor. All right, does that help to you? hope so. Well, let's thank God for it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you've taught us from your word this evening. I pray that you would help us to absorb it and to apply it. God, I pray that, is, that you would help me to be what is described in Ephesians to have these men at Ephesus as a person who is what you want them to be as an elder in the church. We pray it, all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, before we dismiss, let's take a couple minutes just to share some prayer requests with one another, shall we?